Hello? Ladies and gentlemen, could I please request you to be seated? Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for coming for this opening session of the fifth uh, Water Operators Partnerships Congress here in this beautiful city of Bonn, right next to the River of Rhine, and also with fairly nice weather to look around. It's indeed a great pleasure to welcome you to this fifth edition of this Congress. I recall the very first meeting of the GWAPA Steering Committee and its inauguration actually took place during the World Water Day at a meeting there in Cape Town, which was also then at that time graced by the Prince of Orange, who is now the King of the Netherlands. Over the years, the GWAPA Congress has had three of its sessions in the beautiful city of Barcelona. The last Congress took place in a virtual format due to COVID with a great participation. And we're very happy to have all of you together here for this fifth edition of the Water Operators Congress. We have more than 1,500 people who've registered for this event. And the theme of this Congress is really on solidarity and also on sustainability. So ladies and gentlemen, we have a very distinguished panel here to address us during this opening ceremony. And without any further ado, I'd very much like to introduce the Deputy Executive Director of UN Habitat, Mr. Mikhail Milna, who is from Slovakia. And he's a very seasoned diplomat and educator with almost 30 years of experience in senior global assignments. Until April 2023, he was Slovakia's ambassador and permanent representative to the United Nations in New York. During his term, he also co-chaired the intergovernmental negotiations on the Security Council reform during the 77th session of the General Assembly. He also served as vice president of the UNICEF executive board um, of the six, and he was also vice chair of the Peace Building Commission and chair of the sixth committee. Prior to that, Mr. Milner served as Director General for International Organization Development and Cooperation and Humanitarian Aid at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and European Affairs of the Slovak Republic. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a hand to the Executive Director, Deputy Executive Director, and I'd like to invite him to join here at the podium. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Andre, and uh, good morning uh, to you all. I am uh, uh, straight from uh, the Frankfurt airport. Uh, I arrived uh, from Nairobi uh, this morning, and indeed, uh, it's only my second uh, month on, uh, on the new job, and uh, this is my first uh, foreign trip. Uh, so uh, I'm very pleased and, uh, and privileged to uh, really uh, not only visit Bonn, and thank you uh, very much, uh, uh, Madame, uh, Mayor for hosting us and uh, for this uh, uh, wonderful hospitality and for joining us uh, this morning, but uh, uh, also uh, to uh, join you at, uh, at this important uh, event, uh, actually, which is uh, following up really nicely uh, after uh, the recent uh, UN Water Conference, uh, which took place in New York in March uh, uh, after 30 years, uh, and indeed, as, uh, as uh, Andre has mentioned, uh, uh, this time it was co-hosted uh, by uh, the Netherlands, by His Majesty the King himself, uh, and uh, Tajikistan uh, as well. So I think it's, uh, it's really an opportune moment for us uh, to meet uh, uh, in this context uh, following that, but also that uh, this is uh, our first in-person opportunity uh, since uh, uh, the unfortunate uh, global pandemic uh, hit us back in uh, 2020. So welcome, and uh, I really wish you all uh, productive and fruitful deliberations and look forward to engaging with you uh, a lot more. 
So, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, really warm welcome to delegates and partners uh, to the fifth session of the Global Water Operators uh, Partnership Congress. Uh, uh, and um, I think uh, the fact what I, ha which I have just mentioned uh, about uh, the pandemic uh, further reinforces the important need for us to also uh, concentrate on resilience in challenging times, mobilizing collaboration for future ready uh, water and sanitation ser service providers. So access to safe water and sanitation indeed is a basic uh, human need and right for health, well-being, and resilience. Uh, uh, also, the recent uh, 2023 Water Conference uh, in New York uh, uh, alerted us that the world is way off track uh, to meeting the SDG 6 uh, to ensure available and uh, safely managed drinking water for all by 2030. So uh, it is important for all of us to redouble our efforts uh, uh, in this particular context. Uh, and also as we prepare for September for the SDG Summit uh, in New York where we will be looking for solutions, for sharing uh, of best practices and experience. I think uh, uh, you have uh, an important role to play in that context. We will not be meeting uh, at the SDG Summit uh, in New York in September just to complain or to say that uh, we, are, we are lagging behind. We know that. Uh, uh, we need some uh, visions, we need experience sharing, we need new energy that will be able to uh, move us uh, forward. Uh, so in 2020, there were still uh, 3.6 billion people without access to safely managed uh, sanitation and 2 billion without access to drinking water. Persistent disparities in access uh, between countries, uh, urban and rural communities and income groups still leave far too many in need of access to safely managed uh, and safely managed water and sanitation services behind. Within cities, the low income families living in slums, informal settlements commonly pay 10 times more than their wealthier neighbors for water and lack safely managed uh, sanitation facilities for which uh, they pay with ill health. So we need to uh, certainly change this paradigm which is, uh, which is devastating and uh, which is alarming. Uh, yet global forces, climatic, financial, health, the energy crisis and rapid urbanization are testing utilities' ability to maintain services, adapt to new conditions and recover from disruptions. Thousands of water and sanitation operators provide services to billions of people and they are crucial actors in delivering the SDGs by increasing access and delivering safely managed water and sanitation services to all citizens. I cannot overestimate the important role that you, your organizations uh, and uh, partners uh, have played in this important uh, uh, endeavor. And uh, we are really proud uh, of the work that uh, you have been doing. Uh, UN Habitat has been uh, uh, connected uh, to this work in an important manner. And of course, uh, uh, hosting uh, uh, GWOPA here uh, in Bonn since 2020 and before, as you know, in, in Barcelona is uh, something that, uh, that we have uh, indeed been extremely proud of. And we are certainly very much committed to continuing this uh, important work and partnership with you. The achievement of SDG 6 triggers the attainment of every single other SDG, from ending poverty to eliminating hunger, achieving gender equality, ensuring education, combating climate change, attaining sustainable cities and communities, ensuring life on land, providing renewable energy, supporting industry and fostering peace and security. So indeed, uh, this is uh, uh, not uh, narrow focused work. This is uh, in many ways uh, a very cross cutting issue that I, I say often uh, serves as an enabler for, for many other things. It's, it's a bit like a, like a flower that uh, we have in our hands, but when, when we see it uh, open, then of course we do realize the, the full potential and the full scale of, uh, of the work that, uh, that uh, we are focusing on here. 
among others, having safe and stable access to water and sanitation services is indeed a key component of adequate and affordable housing for all, which is a key priority of UN Habitat. Beyond four walls and a roof, adequate housing requires individuals and households to have access to clean water and adequate sanitation. Housing without water and sanitation, as I'm sure you will, we will all agree, somehow simply doesn't make sense. Uh, it is uh, empty. And uh, uh, indeed, uh, uh, this partnership uh, is, uh, is absolutely crucial in, in that context. Uh, UN Habitat is proud to, proud to host the Global Water Operators Partnership Alliance, GWOPA. The alliance was launched uh, actually by former Secretary General of the UN, Kofi Annan, already in uh, 2009, in response to the uh, recognition that many of these essential water and sanitation operators, 90% of which are public, need guidance and technical support, while others are highly capable of uh, willing to support them on uh, a not-for-profit uh, not basis. Over the past 15 years, uh, GWOPA has created a global movement by supporting a vast network of partners through peer-to-peer -peer arrangements called Water Operator Partnerships, and uh, today, we are happy that uh, the WOP approach, a solidarity-based partnership between water and sanitation operators, has become a mainstream and uh, effective approach to accelerating support to achieving SDG 6 and SDG 11. I have always referred to SDG 6 and SDG 11 uh, SDG 11, as I'm sure you know, is on cities and sustainable communities. Uh, as uh, siblings, as uh, uh, you know, crucially connected uh, partners uh, in, in our efforts. Uh, we thank you for being part of this vibrant community. Together with our partners, UN Habitat is committed to implementing the Water Action Agenda, the main outcome of the 2023 Water Conference in New York. During the conference, GWOPA and its network uh, of partners committed to mobilize efforts to implement solidarity-based partnerships between water operators to improve health, livelihoods, water, and food security, and well-being for an estimated 100 million people by 2030. This will only be possible if we work together, each of us committing our respective human, intellectual, and financial resources to this high-impact and low-cost approach. I would like to thank the government of Germany for supporting GWOPA and enabling its five-year hosting within the UN campus here in the beautiful city of Bonn. And also, I would like to thank the city of Bonn, Madame Mayer, and the German water partners. We are equally grateful to the European Commission for their support uh, for the EU WOP program, which enabled 22 uh, WOPs uh, now being implemented globally, the Government of the Netherlands, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as well as the Abu Dhabi Department of Energy, UNICEF Ethiopia, and the OPEC Fund for International Development for their trust, generous support, and uh, collaboration with GWOPA. I would also like to thank our global WOP community for their collaboration and partnership, including with national and regional associations, multilateral development banks, and more than 1,000 individual GWOPA members, all of you. We welcome our new institutional members and encourage uh, more to join the Alliance. In conclusion, uh, dear colleagues uh, and friends, our present reality and our future is undoubtedly urban. Cities can be engines of urban prosperity, hubs of innovation, and places of positive transformation, or, on the contrary, they can be drivers of inequity and places of despair. And we cannot afford uh, uh, missing on the important, uh, uh, on the important uh, uh, energy and the important uh, uh, work that, uh, that is being done in this context uh, in and with our cities. In all cases, the trajectory cities will define the trajectory of our planet. 
well-planned, well-managed urbanization, well-managed resources, including water, and well-governed cities can really make a huge difference uh, uh, in, uh, in our efforts. So I call upon our water and sanitation operators as key providers to participate actively also in the upcoming uh, UN Habitat uh, Assembly, which will take place from the 5th to the 9th of June in Nairobi, Kenya. So it's actually uh, only two weeks uh, from now. And it will focus on advancing global urban policy recommendations for the actions pri prioritized by member states at the high-level meeting of the General Assembly that took uh, uh, place last April. In undertaking this crucial role, you will provide your counterparts in ministries of urban development uh, throughout the world with clear guidance on how best to accelerate the urban dimension of the sustainable development goals. So uh, again, we would like to invite you, your governments, your organizations to join us uh, in this important effort, uh, whether in person or also virtually, because it will be a hybrid meeting. Uh, and uh, I also would like to invite you to invest in sustainable urban development, including uh, in the urban basic services, to harness the transformative power of urbanization towards a more equitable and resilient future for all. UN Habitat and the whole UN system stands ready to continue supporting you in these important efforts. Thank you again, uh, wishing us all a productive conference uh, and uh, looking forward to engaging with you more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much to the uh, Deputy Executive Director for his statement. I'm very happy now to call upon Dr. Marwan El Rakat to deliver a statement on behalf of His Royal Highness the Prince El Hassan bin Talal of Jordan, who unfortunately sends his regrets of not being able to speak directly, but over to Dr. Marwan. Thank you so much, Andre, for your introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to deliver this opening remarks on behalf of His Royal Highness Prince Al Hassan bin Talal of Jordan, who's hosting our entity in Wardam, the Inter Islamic Network on Water Resources Development and Management in Jordan since 1987. And please allow me to pass the regards and greeting of His Royal Highness Prince Al Hassan bin Talal to this gathering. It is also our honor to be invited by Ms. Maimuna Muhammad Sharif to share our thoughts in this timely conference. If we are willing to have a real change and contribute to the SDGs, we should start with a vision. Our vision is healing of the Great Rift Valley that runs from Madagascar to the Toros Mountain and from East Africa to the Red and Dead Sea. And this can be a guiding framework for our policies and projects in the region. That's why we hope that you are all familiar with the achievement and processes that being done at Geneva Water Hub and at the Blue Peace Initiative and the Inter-Islamic Network in Water Resources Development and Management that I represent toward the adaptation and consideration of the water, energy, food, ecosystem, nexus approach through establishing a wifi community of practice around the Red Sea. In fact, this vision was the main resolution of Enwardam 13th Symposium, which was held in March 2023 and was approved by the government surrounding uh, the Jordanian or the Great Rift Valley. As we are all aware, the key to maintaining resilience in a challenging time is efficient water management. And here we can give an example that for years, Jordan has established a solid knowledge and experience in the domain of enhancing water use efficiency and treated wastewater use. And both are issues that the Global Water Operators Partnership Alliance focuses on. It's worth mentioning that more than 90%, if not 95% of Jordan's treated wastewater is now being utilized mostly for irrigation 
and as a major contribution to the food security in Jordan and in the region. And this knowledge, as we believe, should be shared and disseminated within the region for the good of the future of our future generations. Whilst water as a resource and as a trade route remains at the core of many global conflicts, we are convinced that it can be used to advance peace and prosperity. And following the achievement of the global high-level panel on water and peace, we can see that there are two pressing themes in the current international discussion on water. The first is the changes in the global water cycle and has prompted international actors to develop global water portals to consolidate data and make it freely accessible. The second is a growing problem of water scarcity and it is impact on agriculture and food security. In both cases, it is clear that cooperation and support for a policy-driven shared data and knowledge hub on water is essential. And since data sometimes is perceived as too sensitive to be shared, we can promote and work on knowledge sharing for mutual benefit through promoting the success stories. Over years, numerous reports reached the same conclusion. There is a strong correlation between water cooperation and peace. Uh, for example, a report launched in Amman 2013 by the Strategic Foresight Group showed that the 37 countries not engaged in water management and cooperation face a higher risk of war and, war and dispute than the other countries. So we believe that at times of little trust and dialogue, cooperation over water could help build peaceful future in the region. However, this important, it is important to emphasize that it's not just the current water scarce countries that are at the risk. Indeed, within the next two years, more than half of humanity will be facing severe water shortage. This reminds us that no country is immune from threats of water scarcity. And the drought of Europe last year is a prime example of that. Moving forward, we need a wifi community, a water, energy, food, ecosystem, community of practice that should work on the following. First, evidence-based policy making, what is called data to decision, and to support the role of scientific research in policy making within the region. Knowledge exchange and the promotion of success stories around the region. We urge that we need to consider establishing a specialized commission along the lines of the Danube Commission for our region. A Red, a Red Sea Commission, for example, would allow Red Sea states along the neighboring countries to come together and listen to each other and to see different interests and to fashion common solutions for all. We need also to promote the WISE concept. The WISE stands for W-I-S-E, and it's composed of the four components. The first is the water management and technology to minimize losses through effective water management and cooperation in research and innovation. The second component of the WISE is the, is the imbalance of the population resources equation as there is a gross imbalance in countries and between countries across the region, this leads to poverty and in some cases, conflicts. The third component is the social and economic development, including the distribution of development benefit. Finally, we have the E in the WISE, which is the energy and conservation of the environment and to be understood through the WIFI nexus. Ladies and gentlemen, today's gathering of scientists policymakers and members of affected community provide the opportunity to reflect upon these critical issues and move forward with courage as we strive to create a more resilient future. Thank you so much. Thank you very much to Dr. Marwan Arakat, who was speaking on behalf of His Royal Highness uh, Prince El Hassan bin Talal of, of Jordan. Ladies and gentlemen, it's indeed a very, very great pleasure to introduce the next speaker to you, who is the Lord Mayor of the city of Bonn, uh, Katja Dörner. And the Lord Mayor, of course, plays an important role. The Mayor of Bonn in Germany always has an important role also in the national government as being the former capital city of Germany. But the Lord Mayor is also um, a member of the Global Executive Committee of, of ICLE, Local Governments for Sustainability, 
She's also a member of the Advisory Committee of Cities to the Convention of Biological Diversity. And she's also on the German Council for Sustainable Development. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the Lord Mayor. Thank you. Deputy Executive Director Mir Na, Executive Secretary Johnson, dear representatives of water operator partnerships around the globe, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to the fifth global WUPS Congress from Bonn, Germany's United Nations city and host to the Global Water Operators Partnerships Alliance since 2020. And also, the virtual edition of the WUP's Congress was a great success. I am very happy to greet many of you in person this time. Your conference motto, Resilience in Challenging Times, Mobilizing Collaboration for Future Ready Water and Sanitation Service Providers, is on the pulse of time. Water has always made the difference between life and death on our planet for nature and humankind alike. Securing a sustainable future for all is impossible without water. Cities and settlements around the globe need water to survive and thrive. Clean water and sanitation are key to inclusive societies, to sustainable and circular food systems, to economic success. Our primary tasks are granting access to water and sanitation on the one hand, and building and maintaining resilience on the other. Water infrastructures can be threatened for many reasons, and sometimes water itself can become a threat. Chiwopo, the Water Operator Partnerships Alliance under UN Habitat, has successfully stimulated the growing of a lively community of public utility operators on a global scale, and is now facilitating the debate on how public water operators can drive resilience. Our own sanitation department is part of the city administration, responsible for our sewage system and plants, as well as for technical fluid protection. There will be an opportunity for some of you to get to know this work during the excursions on Thursday morning. Speaking of that, we are proud of our innovative QR code for sanitation technology, for instance, which was rewarded with the German Environment Prize. The work of local or regional governments as water operators is never easy. Conflicting interests are a daily routine. Through the GWOPA platform, all lessons learned feed into mutual exchange, peer learning and support. And I highly commend Arthur Johnson and her team for their excellent steering and facilitating the building of this important community. When coping with global emergencies and building up resilience, teaming up is of essence, whether in city-to-city -city partnerships like the one we just started with Kherson in Ukraine, whether in networks like ECLE Local Governments for Sustainability, or whether it's through supporting local networking of all kind. Only recently, we decided to step up our resilience and joined the Making Cities Resilient 2030 initiative of the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. And if all goes well, we will soon become a resilience hub, providing platforms and knowledge exchange to other cities. I assure you, this wouldn't be possible without the valuable networks of Bonn, the Bonn Network for International Civil Protection and Disaster Risk Reduction, the Bonn Water Network, which will be hosting a panel discussion tomorrow evening, and many more. The success story of Bonn as Germany's United Nations cities is indeed made of sustainability, networking, and collaboration, both inside the UN and with the surrounding clusters of German federal institutions, academia, business, and civil society. And that same spirit can be found within Chihuahua and this amazing community of water operators. Let me close by saying that Bonn is proud to have Chihuahua on board as a highly appreciated and well-connected member of the UN Bonn family as the sustainability hub. May this fifth Water Operator Partnership Congress convey a strong message for water 
for resilience, for collaboration, for people, planet and prosperity. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much to the Lord Mayor for her statement. And also just to remind all of us, today is actually also the International Day of Biodiversity. And so a lot of people will be celebrating this in Day of International Biodiversity. With, um, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I'd very much like to introduce Mr. Toili Kurbanov, who is the UN Executive Coordinator and also the designated uh, official in terms of security for the United Nations in Germany. Um, as Executive Coordinator of UNV, Toili is advocating for volunteerism as a powerful and cross-cutting means of implementing the 2030 Agenda and providing strategic leadership of UNV as a global system-wide service for the United Nations. Thank you very much. Let me uh, request to welcome Toili Kolbanov. Over to you. Thank you, Andres, and good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Presenting six welcoming remarks is a challenge for the panel, and I would imagine even more for the audience. So I'll try to address this challenge by asking three questions, which I think you will have a right to raise. First question, where am I exactly welcoming you? Second, who am I to welcome? And the third, so what? Uh, on the first question, I mean, I'm not going to welcome you to a Bonn in the presence of our dear Lord Mayor. It would be odd for me to welcome you to, the, to Bonn, but I'm very pleased to welcome you to the UN Bonn, one of the emerging hubs of the United Nations. The hub that will soon turn 30 years and is already hosting more than 20 UN offices and almost 1,000 UN staff. Uh, some of you on your way here might have passed through the official entrance to the UN Bonn campus, that's where the entrance of the German Bundestag used to be, before the capital moved back to Berlin after the reunification. And in fact, uh, the idea of bringing Bonn, you went to the Bonn, came out in the conversation between the Chancellor Helmut Kohl and the Secretary General Butros Butros Ghali. And soon after, the German government approached the United Nations, specifically UNDP. Some of you might know UNDP, United Nations Development Program, with an offer to relocate UNDP headquarters to the former of German Bundestag building, rent-free, modernized, well-maintained. For various reasons, UNDP didn't want to move, but they were under the pressure from the Secretary General. So they had, the then head of UNDP called the then head of UNV, who was based in Geneva, and said, I think you should move to Bonn. He said, since you are UN volunteers, I have just volunteered you to the Secretary General to be the first UN agencies to be established in Bonn. So we never looked back after that. Which brings me to the second question, why me? So every head of UNV, since UNV is the first UN entity to have been established in Bonn, every head of UNV receives delegation of authority from the Secretary General to be responsible for the functioning of the UN Bonn campus, which makes that the conference rooms are functioning, the meeting rooms are functioning, the water is running, the lights are on, the roofs are not leaking. These are, by the way, Mr. Mirdal, my performance indicators for this week. You can hold me to account up to the end of the, con of the Congress. But thanks to the very close collaboration with the German government at all levels, particularly with the city of Bonn, uh, the effective functioning of UN Bonn is, is possible. And in addition to hosting 1,000 UN staff, uh, last year alone, which was the first year after COVID, we hosted 120 international meetings here. If you take out the four weeks around the Christmas, six weeks in the summer, that about, that's about three international meetings every week that are being organized here in Bonn. And these are all international multi-stakeholder multilateral meetings. Which brings me to the final point, so what? It's about multilateralism. UN Bonn is about multilateralism. Bonn is the hub of multilateralism. And it is so crucial, important. We already live in the new era the era of climate change, the era of uh, geopolitical earthquakes, the era of artificial intelligence, but the era we don't quite understand. And the Secretary General, therefore, Antonio Guterres, is never tired of reminding, it's precisely at times like this, that the humanity should stick together, and we should not rely on unilateral action 
but we should lean towards multilateral collaboration, which is why every meeting, and even especially your meeting, is even more valuable nowadays. And I really applaud you to uh, having uh, sticking together and keeping this collaboration going. In fact, in my day work as the head of UNB, we're also trying to do everything that we can to support multilateral action. Every year, thousands of UN volunteers are spread all over the world in every emergency response in the myriad of uh, development projects around the world, and they are implementing multilateral solutions. Even more so, they're bringing multilateralism to the grassroots level. And what they do by delivering multilateralism, the volunteers, they work not only with their hands, with their heads, but also with their hearts. Which is why we say no chat GPT will ever replace you and volunteers. And finally, what I'd like to say by way of welcoming remarks is to once again congratulate you for sticking together as one global community of practice, for bringing your Congress to Bonn, and for keeping multilateralism, the hope of multilateralism alive. Welcome. Thank you very much, Toili, for your statement. And also thank you very much to Toili for being a very good landlord to all the UN agencies, together with the government and uh, with the city of Bonn. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure now uh, to call upon a video statement from His Excellency Dr. Engineer Haptamu Itefa Geleta who is the Minister for Water and Energy in the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia. So I hope our colleagues got the technology set up. So that ladies, can... ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank the organizers to give me the opportunity to share with you those opening remarks that I'm going to do as below. It is high time to change our way of thinking and doing. In that respect, we must recognize operators as key players in improving water and the sanitation for all, which are essential to local health and the well-being of everywhere and everyone. Public service providers are solving the big global challenge locally. They help deliver on all of the SDG 6 targets and contribute to achieve all other SDG 6. They help and build and maintain the social contract with the population. To ensure we leave nobody and no place behind to achieve SDG 6 and other water-related SDGs, effective management and affordable service present major challenge. Strengthening local public water and sanitation service is a priority for sustaining service that guarantee human rights. Water operators need to be further empowered to deliver on the global water agendas by giving them a voice in their implementation and providing them with the instruments. This includes finance, enabling utility-friendly position with international, national, and the local policies and the laws, and strengthening strengthened capacities. Under the leadership of my ministry here in Ethiopia, we are we have a strong commitment of Ethiopian Ministry of Water and Energy in strengthening capacity of water and sanitation service providers. Second, recent review of water policy makes clear provision for finance, for financial autonomous utilities while providing equitable wash service. Third, one wash national program, ha which had dedicated budget component for capacity building and the post construction utility strengthening. Fourth, government of Ethiopia is in process of establishing a regulatory framework for water and sanitation service provider utilities to regulate quality, cost, finance equity, private sector involvement of water and sanitation service delivery. The last one, recently, a technical committee for post construction capacity building of utilities has been established, chaired by the Ministry of Water and Energy, which supports exchange and knowledge sharing, strategy, development, and advocacy for utility strengthening. In addition, we are currently experimenting 
the Water Operators Partnership approach with various partners, including UNICEF Ethiopia and Global Water Operators Partners Alliance for several utilities and other initiatives relying on peer-to-peer -peer learning. Bidre Town and Bule and uh, Doigena Towns in Ethiopia, mentoring by local and international mentors, National Water and Sewerage Corporation of Uganda as international mentor leading the whole mentoring process while Ambo and uh, Walaita Soto, this town in Ethiopia, has been closely supported. The day-to-day -day support for Oromia and uh, SNNP regions, respectively. These two local mentor towns were mentored by Vey and Durban Water before they transform to local mentor. So that the WOP, the Water Operators Partners, mentoring process will continue in the same way. We believe that being fully action-oriented, WOPs have a strong potential for scalability, visibility, and a global impact to improve our public service. Scaling up professional peer partnership between water and sanitation utilities around the world is urgent to improve the capacity and the performance of utilities. Such organizational capacity improvements are supporting utilities, uptake of inclusive service for improvement and access to climate finance. These partnerships often generate a ripple effect with the MNT and the local mentor utility going on to share its enhanced capacity with other utilities. We believe that there is a strong potential in our country to embrace and scale up the WOP approach at the national level and we are determined to support utilities to become more sustainable and support one another on solidarity basis. I thank you very much. Thank you very much for the uh, statement by His Excellency the Minister from Ethiopia. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure now to welcome Mr. Tiresh Katri who is the Joint Secretary in the Ministry of Water and Sanitation in the Government of Nepal. And Mr. Katri has been heavily involved in Nepal's work on sanitation and contributing to making the country open defecation free. Uh, and in addition, he's also promoting a Water and Sanitation Act, which is going to give frameworks for operators, water and sanitation operators in the country. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Katri. Thank you, Andrew. Distinguished guests, esteemed delegates, ladies and gentlemen. I am honored to welcome all of you to, to this Global Congress on Resilience in Challenging Times, mo mobilizing collaboration for future-ready water and sanitation service providers. As highlighted by previous speakers, this Congress serves as an invaluable platform for collective dialogue and action. As you address and as you address the pressing need for resilient water and sanitation services in the face of unprecedented challenges, we stand today at a critical juncture where the collective mobilization of global efforts is crucial to ensure safe and inclusive water and sanitation services for all, leaving no one behind. The theme of this Congress is a reflection of the realities faced by water and sanitation service providers worldwide, particularly in the Global South. These regions encounter unique challenges, inclusivity, diversity, and equity that demand our utmost attention and dedication. It is imperative that we focus on their specific perspectives and engage in comprehensive discussions to identify and address their issues effectively. Access to safe and in inclusive water and sanitation services remains a significant concern for millions of people across the Global South. Population growth, rapid urbanization, and climate change exacerbate the strain on already inadequate infrastructure. Inequalities in service provision further marginalize vulnerable communities, compounding the socioeconomic challenges they face. The global water crisis is not limited to access alone, and not only to externalities. 
poor quality of infrastructure and weak management by UT op utility operators make these services inadequate, unreliable, costly, and unsustainable. Contamination, pollution, and waterborne diseases pose significant threats to public health. Collaborate, collaborate efforts must be undertaken to enhance water treatment, promote safe sanitation practices, and improve hygiene behaviors, particularly in resource-constrained settings. System resilience must be improved against disaster and climate change. Adoption of digital technologies and innovative approaches will play a transformative role in addressing these challenges. Technology-enabled solutions such as smart water management system, real-time data analytics, and remote monitoring can enhance the efficiency, sustainability, and resilience of water and sanitation infra infrastructure. Additionally, building capacity and knowledge sharing through twinning or learning programs across region can help utilities to help become efficient, better organized, modernized, and make them prepared to address issues of inclusive and sustainable goal, growth. To this end, this Congress serves as a crucial platform for knowledge exchange, networking, and collaboration. Through interactive sessions, panel discussions, and workshops, we aim to foster a comprehensive understanding of the global changes faced by water and sanitation service providers in the global south. As we deliberate over the next few days, I urge you to embrace a holistic approach that encompasses the social, economic, and environmental dimensions of resilience. Let us work to create a future where communities are empowered, where the vulnerable are protected, and where no one is left behind. Your expertise, experiences, and insights will undoubtedly shape the outcomes of this Congress and, more importantly, contribute to building a better future for generations to come. Generations to come. Once again, I extend my warm welcome to all of you in this Congress and express my heartfelt thanks for being with us in this cause. Let us have a fruitful and productive event. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Katri, for his statement. I'm very happy now to call upon Mr. Marco de la Marca, who is a member of the cabinet of Mrs. Dubravna Suica, who is the vice president for democracy and demography of the European Commission. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Excellent, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and thank you for the invitation to address you today. I bring you the regards of Vice President Schuitza, who wanted to be here with you, but uh, you know, um, due to other previous commitments, uh, could not join you and delegated me. Nonetheless, she asked me to convey these messages. First of all, both the meeting of Vice President Schuitza with the young water and sanitation professionals during the last UN Water Conference in New York and my presence here today are part of the same continuous line showing the importance of water and sanitation within the Green Deal as priorities of the European Commission. The European Union recognizes the human right to safe drinking water and sanitation, the importance of protecting and restoring ecosystems, the circular economy and climate adaptation, the mobilization and sustainability of financial resources, the need for strong governance at all levels, and last but not least, research and innovation. Next Wednesday, in two days, Eurostat will publish the latest statistics on SDG 6. We hope to detect only improved indicators, but in this case we consider each achieved target as the point of departure towards a more ambitious goal. We are also aware of the challenges and of the targets we didn't meet yet, and look forward to cooperate with all of you to move towards the same direction. I know Vice President Schuitz already anticipated in New York the skills issue and how we aim to face it. For those of you who are not in New York, she stated that we need your labor market to have enough inclusive and qualified offer to help deliver. 
In your domain, we are proud of the results achieved in the European Union, notably on biochemical oxygen demand in rivers, below 4% in all member states, nitrate in groundwater, except one member states, all the others are below 30 milligrams per liter, phosphate in rivers. Nonetheless, we already spoke about leaving no one behind. And there is one country where in 2020, in the European Union, more than 20% of the population was living in households without basic sanitary facilities. And in three more, we are unfortunately still above 5%. There were three countries where less than half of the population was connected to at least secondary wa wastewater treatment. And three more, where less than 50% of the inland water bathing sites have excellent water quality. We know that good indicators are the results of efforts, investments, and increasingly challenging self-imposed targets. Both my own country, I'm an Italian national, and the one of Vice President Shuica, she is Croatian, are now experiencing once again floods that show how much water management is still a challenge we need to face. We are still working to improve the situation domestically. Both industrial and agricultural pollutants are still threatening our water quality. We realize how advanced we are, but we do not rest on our laurels and try to lead by example. But in this case, we are not jealous if someone overcomes us. And indeed, we are now ready and willing to share our know-how. And Vice President Schuitz did it in New York by endorsing the 33 commitments the EU submitted. They range from supporting improved access to water and sanitation for 70 million individuals. I know if compared with the figures that have already been mentioned, it's not a lot, but of course, the destination is a succession of small steps. To strengthening policy and regulatory frameworks, framework in the areas of climate pollution, biodiversity, and circular economy, and water actions in relation to transboundary water cooperation. In addition, the EU committed over 1 billion euro to water management, working with third countries to support livelihoods, energy, food, and peace with the Global Gateway, let alone the WOP that Mr. Mlina already mentioned. So on behalf of Vice President Schuitza, I sincerely wish you all a fruitful working day, and I look forward to hear more solutions than problems, more half-full glasses than half-empty, but even more that those glasses are full of well-managed hydric resources. Thank you. Thank you so much to Mr. De La Marca for delivering this uh, statement on behalf of Mrs. Suica. And now it's a great pleasure to introduce Orsa Johnson, the head of the GWAPA Secretariat at UN Habitat, to give us a quick overview of the Congress and what you can expect over the next couple of days, exciting things happening here. Orsa, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, André, uh, our distinguished panel here, and all of you that have joined us here today. I just want to firstly really warmly welcome you uh, on behalf of the Guapa Secretariat. Um, there's been a lot of preparations going on, and, and a lot not only from the Secretariat, but also in partnership with many of you here. And we are just so pleased that it's, it's happening now here in, in this beautiful uh, UN city of Bonn. Um, I uh, just want to, just a couple of things in terms of the spirit of this Congress, and then just briefly share with you some of the highlights in terms of the program. Uh, firstly, uh, we heard from our UN Habitat uh, Deputy Executive Director that we're off track as a global community when it comes to SDG 6 targets. And uh, we, we really uh, believe that to achieve the SDGs, this has to be done at the local level. And this has to be done in partnership with local actors. And we're here these uh, four days together to really celebrate the significant role that water and sanitation utilities play in the global efforts on the SDGs. Uh, secondly, several of us probably met already recently in New York at the UN 2023 conference. And we walked away there, the Guapa Alliance, with, with a very big commitment, friends. We have committed by 2030 to have 100 new water operator partnerships to reach millions, millions of people. So with, with that action as our guiding light, we, we're really here to talk about opportunities, partnerships, 
to really accelerate action here today and to celebrate this solidar solidarity-based approach that, that WAPS brings. So now, just a couple of things on housekeeping, as I know we're just slightly running over schedule, housekeeping and, and, and the design of this uh, Congress. So in terms of the uh, types of events that you will be participating in, there's kind of, there's a few typologies. There's the plenaries that are here. We will be starting a plenary just now in a few minutes, the first thematic plenary here. These are held in the mornings and there's one also uh, in the end of the day at five. And we were hoping to see all of you here to listen to these um, keynote themes. We then have over 50 different uh, sessions and we feel proud as the Secretariat to have tried as much as possible also to have interpretation in four languages in as many of these plenaries and sessions that we can. These run in parallel. If you have any questions about where you want to be or should be, please come to the registration. And we also have a signage board there in terms of where these different sessions are taking place. Because in a number of instances, these are three, four sessions in parallel. So we just want to help to guide you as much as we can. Uh, we also have uh, posters at the area of the coffee. And we have dedicated times when there will be uh, you know, uh, partners there to share um, items around their posters and the work that they're doing. So please join us there with a cup of coffee and, and, and use that time as well for exchange. Uh, at the end of Wednesday, we are streamlining a joint uh, event with our German uh, WAPS event happening in Berlin. So we will share some more details on that to make sure that you all stay for that last segment, which at six o'clock on Wednesday, uh, combined with, a, with the end of the Congress cocktail as well um, uh, on, on the last day. But actually, it's not the last day, because on Thursday, we have a number of field trips that the mayor of Bonn already highlighted. And we really encourage as many of you as possible to sign up for those and take advantage of learning some of the very interesting practices in our host city here. So I think that's more or less the program. I just want to let all of you know that we, as a secretariat, we are available at the registration for any questions that you have. Uh, we made sure that you all come in uh, in the morning, but please do come back to register for those who didn't. And please do sign up for those who have time this evening for the cocktail that is generally, generously being hosted by the city of Bonn. Thank you very much, and looking forward now to handing over to Adrian um, Mills from VEI, who will be moderating the next session here in the plenary. But before he takes the stage, I would like to really sincerely thank all our distinguished speakers uh, this morning. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much to Osa for giving us a quick overview of the uh, Congress. And uh, I just wanted to thank all the uh, distinguished panelists who've come together and shared their wisdom with us and uh, opening this Congress with us. This is now sort of coming to the end of this opening ceremony. And I think we've seen that there's going to be a very exciting program ahead of us. And I would like to encourage all of you to WAP a lot, so exchange a lot through WAPs. And we'll be moving over to the next session now, which is on resilient water and sanitation services at a final, uh, at, on a finite planet. So over to the next moderator, please. Thank you. Very good morning to you. It's an honor and a pleasure to stand here as the first uh, moderator of today uh, for this uh, first plenary of this uh, Jiwopa session, uh, Jiwopa conference, the, the fifth actually in its row, uh, a very important one uh, considering the theme. And I would like to uh, warmly welcome you all. And it's uh, also would like to express that it's uh, really great to see you here as, uh, as, as practitioners of water uh, and sanitation operators, as well as from uh, representatives from water management organizations, 
as well as organizations that are supporting uh, water utilities and water management organizations in their practices uh, to become better. Um, this conference, I think, is really timely. It was already commemorated uh, during the opening session, but we, uh, face, we see the water sector faced with many challenges. And um, that's also why I think uh, resilience and the theme of resilient, resilient water and sanitation services is, is a very important one. As we all uh, agree on, I think that services provided by water and sanitation utilities are vital to ensure uh, community health and well-being. And at the same time, we see that global forces, climatic, financial, energy, also rapid population growth and urbanization are testing our abilities to maintain services, adapt, and we have to adapt to those new conditions. As we see temperatures and sea levels rise, and we see extreme weather conditions becoming more and more common, utilities like us, we have to need to, need to prepare. Ecosystems relied on by utilities for the multitude of services are declining. And we also see that many utilities are now having to pay high costs to replace the invaluable work of forests and wetlands, having to pay high, uh, in sourcing, purifying, and treating water that has become less reliable. We also see that many of our colleagues are also needing to adapt to conflicts where basic services and infrastructure can be casualties, if not direct targets, of warfare, inflation, and high pro energy prices. And those are taking further tolls on often already financially precarious utilities. So therefore, this session, in this session, we would like to discuss how water and sanitation operat operators like us could integrate resilience in their day-to-day -day work and long-term planning. And the speakers and the panelists will share their experiences and lessons on how they have built resilience to keep their service robust and inclusive, despite of climatic, financial, and social stresses on their systems. The session, therefore, will draw attention to the urgency of climate adaptation and mitigation in all utility operations and illustrate how utilities can partner to build resilience through peer support networks. In order to start, I would like to call upon our keynote speaker first, and after that we will follow with a panel. And our keynote speaker will be Mrs. Andrea Metza Murillo, and she is the Deputy Ex Executive Secretary of the United Nations Convention to Combat Decertification the UNCCD. Welcome. And you will deliver the keynote speech. Um, you, were a, you have a previous experience as a, as a Minister of Energy and Environment for the government of Costa Rica. And in your keynote speech, you will share insights on the importance of resilience in water and sanitation services and discuss the role of the UNCCD in addressing global challenges and the need for sustainable development goals in the context of water and sanitation services. So welcome to you, uh, Mrs. Murillo. Oh, good morning, and it's, real, um, it's a real pleasure to be here with you. Uh, and I've been here in some of the previous interventions, and, and you're talking about key important words. Um, collaboration, solidarity, sustainability. And it's about that transformation, and it's the only way to really achieve the SDGs, and it's the only way to maintain your business models. I really would like to start this conversation maybe with some questions first. <laughs> How many of you um, knows what we are celebrating here today? Globally, there is a big celebration today. It's an important day. Biodiversity Day, yes. Biodiversity Day. And why Biodiversity Day is an important day to celebrate? Because it's live. Another one. One of the things with the organizers is that if we don't have good answers, you will not be able to have lunch. So, <laughs> colleagues. <laughs> Um, yes, it's Biodiversity Day, but I have another question. How many of you, do you know what UNCCD, the convention that I represent, do you know what it's about? Have you heard about UNCCD? Yes, I, I heard it, yes, where? <laughs> Whoa, 
Okay, this is the convention. It's one of the three Rio conventions. It's the convention that deals with land, land management, land conservation, land restoration, and also it deals with drought, drought resilience. So this is why I think they invited me here today to talk about all these interrelated issues. Um, and in this biodiversity day, I will say it's important to reflect on this dependency that we have on healthy land and healthy ecosystems to guarantee the provision of water. Um, and as I was saying, yes, water is in the heart of your business model, but I will say that land and ecosystems, such as forests and wetlands and other ecosystems, should be also in, your, in the heart of your business model. Um, and why? Because to guarantee clean water, over 90% of the world's cities and 75% of accessible fresh water sources depend on watersheds that are covered by forest. So here you see, to guarantee the, the element, the vital element of your business model, you need healthy land and healthy ecosystems. A and this is, it's very simple, science is clear, is there. But, um, but we are not really um, using nature and using these ecosystems as this natural infrastructure that filters sediment and nutrient pollution from bodies of water. We're not really doing that. Um, we're still um, doing a lot of land use change, destroying this forest, destroying these ecosystems. And, um, and we're not doing this in many ways because we're not sometimes consider the value of nature and the impact that it has within our operations. How many of you are really having economic numbers of this impact? When we lose a watershed, when we lose this forest, are you putting this inside your plans, your numbers, your operations? Any of you? Not really. And sometimes this is why in many of the cases, we're not really taking seriously the value and importance of nature. Let me share with you a um, concrete number here. Right now, less than 0.2% of global GDP is channeled to maintain and preserve ecosystems. But half of global GDP depends on nature. And probably if we do a concrete analysis on your sector, this n number will be even higher in the case of water operators. So probably this number explains uh, why we're not on track to halt biodiversity loss, to avoid land degradation, and also we're not on track, as you know, to achieve the Paris goal because everything is interlinked and nature is a big piece of the solution. But the good news, because we always have good news, is that recently the world came together and adopted the new global framework on biodiversity. And right now what we have is that we have clear goals of the things we need to do to transform our economies, our businesses into nature positive operations. And one of the goals, it's a very concrete one, some of them are related with the conservation and restoration of 30% of the terrestrial ecosystems. It's a very concrete number. And why this is important? because it's something we can incorporate in our plans. It's something we can incorporate in the way we are doing our businesses. And this is the call. This is what I would like you, this is the invitation today on this Biodiversity Day, that you, as water operators, really take some of these targets, global targets, as we have in the climate world. We have the goals 
And there is now a big movement to incorporate these targets in everything that we do. So it's the same right now with these global biodiversity targets that we have. We can take them, we can incorporate them, and also in this way, then we will be able to mobilize technical and financial resources. And there are some concrete ways in which you can do this. You have been, and I'm sure that many of you are very engaged in watershed management. And we know about good experiences on payment of environmental services schemes where water operators are engaged. But we need to scale up all these practices. We cannot continue losing forest. We really need to address these elements of, as well of land degradation. And to do this, this element of bringing together and considering land use planning now becomes an important tool. And it's also an invitation for you to come together, know more about UNCCD, this other convention, because within this convention, you will find a lot of decisions related to that, to land use planning, related to the nexus of urban and rural landscapes and how we should be managing these landscapes as well to guarantee that target of protecting and restoring 30% of these terrestrial ecosystems. And it's also, as well, um, an invitation to continue engaging in many differences. And now I'm going to talk about the other piece that it is related with this convention, which is drought resilience and drought as well. I probably, if I say, how many of you are now facing issues with drought? Can you raise your hands? Drought, yeah. And what we know right now is that with the, with the effects of climate change, we will have more events with more frequency, with more intensity. So what we cannot do is close our eyes and assume that this will not be the issue that we have to address. We need to start also investing and adopting in drought resilience. And this is as well an invitation to continue building momentum about the political importance of drought resilience. And recently, the government of Spain and the government of Senegal, they launched the International Drought Resilience Alliance uh, during uh, the Shark Marshake Cup. And at that level, both presidents, President Sanchez and President Macky Sall, with other global leaders, they started this movement. We need to start investing and, build and mobilizing more resources for drought resilience. So this is a great opportunity as well because the alliance is an intergovernmental alliance, participation of different entities. So it's an invitation for you as well to join the alliance, to start working together on what are effective measures that you need to put in place to generate and to be more prepared for the other big events that you will be facing. There are some concrete numbers. Um, the World Bank is saying that uh, drought has clearly emerged as the single most destructive, destructive natural disorder, disaster. And uh, the World Bank says that droughts are four times more costly than floods. So again, all this is just to bring your attention. This is also, not, this is not an environmental issue. This is a development issue, and you play an important role as well to start dealing with these two issues. Mobilize more resources for the conservation, the management, and the restoration of different ecosystems and land, because you need it for your operations. It's, the, it's a very cost-effective uh, investment. And also, 
it will be critical to regenerate resilience, drought resilience. And there are a lot of good initiative and collaboration because it's the only way to really address all these issues. Um, at UNCCD, there is now a political discussion. There is a working group, international working group on drought. The parties of the convention are discussing what will be the outcome. Does the world need a protocol? Does the world need a, a global goal like we have in adaptation? That it's something that is happening inside the process right now. Uh, and the COP will be in Saudi Arabia in 2024. And then we will know what the parties decide. But there is all, certainly a, this collaboration platform right now, such as IDRA, that can be a tool to accelerate this section, to facilitate this collaboration. So it's really an invitation for you to continue to engage more with UNCCDs. UNCCD is here and ready to engage with you as well and to work together to protect these ecosystems, to restore and protect land as a way to really guarantee and protect water. Because at the end, it's what we're all looking for and it's what you need. So this is just this invitation for that and I hope you have a very fruitful um, event and conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Murillo. It reminds me of a bike ride that I made last year in um, the dunes of uh, one of the water companies in the Netherlands. Uh, and they are using those dunes to uh, store their water in an aquifer, and those that water also serves as a uh, natural source of water for their uh, yeah, for nature conservation. It's a very beautiful area, and what I learned actually is that about 40% of the biodiversity of the Netherlands act is actually being uh, stored in those those dunes. So these these water catchment areas they can serve as a very important uh, biomarker, indeed. So thank you very much uh, for this inspiring speech. Uh, we would like to uh, now uh, start a panel. And for that, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Yusuf Nasef, the director of the Adaptation Division of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. I would like to invite Dr. Franziska Meinziger, uh, the Infrastructure Development Director of Hamburg Wasser. I would like to invite Dr. Animesh Kumar. He is the head of the UNDDR office in, uh, in Bonn. I would like to invite Dr. Yus uh, I'm sorry, I would like to invite engineer Tanjaratswa Joy Niamayaro from the um, Harare Water Dep Department in Zimbabwe. And I would like to uh, uh, call upon Ms. Ursuhan Sener, the Director of International Affairs of the Marmara Municipalities Union. see whether this mic is working. Is it? Yes? No? So, yeah, it's working. So I would, um, I think it's nice if I sit among you in the same uh, circle. Um, and I would like to ask you a number of questions. And I think it might also be nice if you have questions to each other to ask them as well. But I first would like to um, address um, you first, uh, Dr. Animesh uh, Komar. We uh, learned that you are heading the UN Disaster Risk Reduction Office here in Bonn. So this is kind of a home match uh, for you, I think. And that, amongst others, you are responsible for the portfolio on climate action data and also the monitoring of the uh, Sendai framework. And um, I would like to ask you if you could maybe elaborate what is actually the Sendai framework but also how you would define resilience in the context of water and sanitation services delivery. Thank you very much. I think uh, it's a very uh, a good opportunity to talk about it. And this event in particular is very special for UNDRR as well, because uh, I was just telling Yosef as well that I, just a couple of hours back, I have landed back from New York 
and I was there for the midterm review of the Sendai framework. So that concluded on Friday evening, and I'm here speaking on Monday morning. So this is the first event where a UNDRR official is speaking after the conclusion of the midterm review event. Now, Sendai framework is a paradigmatic shift that we have made over years, over years and decades of learning. And we have learned it the hard way. I mean, if I talk about the Yokohama strategy and the years before that, and followed by the Hyogo framework, and then the Sendai framework, every time we realize that we have this cognitive bias that we turn all our actions focused on a specific event, and that event being a disaster. We prepare for that event, we respond to it, we recover from it, and then we prepare for it again, and this cycle continues. At the same time, we realize that a lot of our developmental actions create risk for the future. And if development creates risk for the future, and we keep looking at an event happening and then we prepare for it, it becomes very counterintuitive in the way we work. And this is the cycle we want to break down. And hence, the Sandai framework made this big shift that we should not just talk about an event and responding to it, but we should also talk about doing development in a way that responds to risk ex ante and does not create risk for the future. So that's a basic essence of Sandai framework. What makes Sendai Framework very uh, unique as well compared to other predecessors and other frameworks on disaster reduction is that it has very quantified targets. There are seven targets, 38 indicators. 11 of these 38 indicators are the same as the SDGs. So under SDG 1, 11, and 13, there are many indicators which are the same as the Sendai Framework. And the countries do not have to report to those SDG indicators. They report to us, we compile all that information, and submit to for the SDG calculations. We have done some analysis and we find that 90% uh, of disasters that are happening as of now are water related. We have also found that 95% of the economic losses that are happening are because of water related disasters. And every nine out of 10 events that are happening are water related. And this is a big pointer. And the figures that I'm talking about are very interesting because I was hearing in the opening ceremony as well, His Royal Highness from Jordan was talking about data challenges. But we also should acknowledge that the SDG big data revolution, the Sendai big data revolution, has really created a lot of information that we need to really harness. The figures I'm quoting, 90%, 95%, are defensible because they're official statistics reported by the governments. And hence, we are much stronger in generating the right level of risk accountability. If I flip it around and say, okay, if it's all about then water becomes a center for resilience building activities, how do, what are you doing about it then? And there are several examples that I have in store for you, but perhaps I will point to one of the most important ones as of now is early warning systems. We need to acknowledge that majority of the disasters, because they're water related, are also being caused because of either deficit or excess of water. And hence, water becomes that limiting factor. If we monitor it properly, we can really strengthen our own resilience and resilience of the systems and communities. And we pick up any early warning system globally, you would see that it somehow it centers around water-related topics. Um, last year, the UN Secretary General has made an announcement that by 2027, every person on Earth would be protected by an early warning system. And this initiative is being led by UNDRR and WMO, and we have a big collaboration among different organizations. And we really want to ensure that uh, this being a very ambitious task can also be realized in the next five years. So I'll stop with that for the first turn and hope to have more discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kumar. <laughs> Let me then go to uh, Dr. Francisca Meinziger from the Hamburg Wasser uh, Company. Hamburg Wasser is one of the largest uh, companies, water companies in the Germany. And so uh, you're responsible for strategic aspects in infrastructure development related to asset management and climate adaptation. I was actually wondering what kind of challenge you are facing when it comes to uh, ensuring resilience in the, in the organization and in the service delivery. And also, how do you incorporate resilience then in your long-term planning? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Hamburg Wasser is the second largest public utility in Germany for water and wastewater services. 
So there are more than two million people relying on water supply and wastewater treatment from us. And therefore we need to provide resilient infrastructure and also we need to contribute to a resilient society. And resilience, in my understanding, it's, uh, it's the matter of addressing or adapting and withstanding any external shocks or challenges. And I think there are many. You see there are a lot of changes. And first, it was mentioned already, the, the climate change. Um, it's a big challenge for us. Um, so we, we see change in, in rainfall patterns. We see warmer, hotter, drier summers, droughts are an issue. And um, also any uh, like natural hazards affecting our infrastructure. So we need to protect our infrastructure. We need to assess the vulnerability and also implement measures to, to protect our technical infrastructure. On the other side, we also need to look um, on our water resources that we can use for water supply. And um, we will see also change in, in water demand. Um, summer gets um, hotter and drier, so there's an increase in water demand. And um, we need to address that. We need to look at our water resources so to do some um, planning <laughs> scenarios of what could happen and also diversify also um, our water resources. So we are addressing that by looking into use of um, stormwater or grey water recycling and um, adding that to our water resources. And of course, since I'm responsible also for asset management, aging infrastructure is a problem and increasing prices, the costs are, are rising and therefore we need to look at how to upgrade our infrastructure to keep pace with um, increasing demands, but also aging infrastructure and innovation is also key um, for that. And you, do you integrate all these trends or how do you integrate all these challenges then in the long-term planning of, uh, of there, infrastructure? They are manifold, therefore we need to develop um, different strategies. So um, with regard to climate change, we are particularly focusing on nature-based solutions as well. Um, retaining stormwater, um, green infrastructure in addition to the grain, uh, um, to the gray infrastructure. But of course, um, challenges also are um, certain events, like it was mentioned before, cyber attacks. Um, we, we need to have um, cyber, a good cyber security. To, we need to have contingency plans also for natural hazards, so we are in um, looking into the, uh, those emergency plans and of course not only developing the plans but also practicing it. You need to have you, uh, your staff being able to, to do the right things in, in a case of an emergency or a hazard and um, also like power failures could be an issue. We had the energy crisis or we're still having it in a way. So we also need to look at uh, maybe um, power backup sources and we integrate that in our planning. Thank you, very interesting. And also, uh, good learning experience. I would like to move to uh, you, Dr. Uh, Yusuf Nassaf. You're the director of the uh, Adaptation Division of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And you've led the uh, adaptation work streams on the, on the, under the uh, UNFCCC since their inception. Uh, one of the... Um, One of the um, specific constraints that uti utilities are facing is the increasing pressure on water resources in terms of quantity because of climate change. And we see that happening more and more. Can you share with us some of your um, outlooks on the evol evol evolution of global water resources? Well, thank you. And as, as, we, as we heard in, uh, in the opening, the Lord Mayor said water is life. I think we can't <laughs> underestimate that. Um, there's, there's two different answers to this question, which is today versus tomorrow. Um, as we see today, I mean, part of the framing that I came with and, and that scared me a lot in, in, in reading up um, on, on the relevant literature is that we have today 1,200 children under five uh, dying every day because of poor sanitation and, and, and water-related issues. At the same time, um, Andrea told us that uh, ecosystems are essential 
um, for the water cycle, and yet we're paying 0.2% of global GDP in, in stewardship, and it provides us with 50% of, uh, of our uh, economic well-being. And so we have a huge disconnect, and it's getting worse. And so today, we, are, we already have a huge deficit in achieving the SDGs, especially SDG 6, SDG 11, as has been mentioned. But tomorrow, 2030, is, um, is, is, is a place where, yes, we may be celebrating that we have, uh, we have plugged the, the, the holes that were identified in 2015, but it will be a very different world because of climate change. And so there will be an exacerbation of, um, of the problems facing us in terms of water resources. And Imesh just mentioned that it's either too much water or too little water. Um, no one is immune to this. Um, so we've seen here in Germany the floods uh, down south in Bad Neuenahr, very close to here. We've seen massive floods in Bangkok over 10 years ago. We've seen uh, f uh, droughts in, in the U.S., forest fires, etc. So um, the notion of, uh, of incremental action is no longer possible as we look in the long term. And so um, climate change will become a, th a threat uh, multiplier. What what are we doing to help um, avoid that from happening? So the science told us that we have a decade to transform, transform our socioeconomic systems, and to reduce emissions um, by 43% uh, by the year 2030. The promises we have now from governments amount to an increase of 10.6% by 2030. So we're moving in the opposite direction. So uh, we're, in, we're in, a, in a scenario that's very similar to the movie Don't Look Up, basically, where, yes, we acknowledge uh, we're, we're so um, drawn by short-termism because we already have problems today in terms of water resources. We're, we're leaving people behind. The poor are, are paying more than the rich to access water. Um, we have uh, infrastructures that are ailing and that are not as efficient as, as they should be. And at the same time, the world is changing in a direction that... Uh, makes these problems pale, but it's our comfort zone to think of today's problems rather than rebuild a future that takes into account um, some uh, a, a paradigm shift in terms of water. Now, um, w one of the things that w w were told to me repeatedly in, in the World Urban Forum, since we're in a habitat uh, context here as well, is that the, the municipal governments and, and cities do not receive much of the funding that's available for climate change action from the climate change process. And I suspect that water operators are in the same situation. Now, the, the, the UNFCCC, the climate change international process, um, has supporting it a financial mechanism with a variety of funds, all of which support water. So that's the common factor across all of them. And I think it's important for this alliance to interface very well with us, but also with national governments that are eligible for receiving support, especially in developing countries. So we have the, the, the Global Environment Facility Trust Fund, we have the Least Developed Countries Fund for LDCs, who have always put water as their number one priority in their plans. We have the Adaptation Fund, we have the Green Climate Fund, and there's a lot of resources there that need to trickle down to that transformative imperative um, that should be undertaken by, by water operators. At the same time, we support national adaptation plans um, for all developing countries for medium and long-term adaptation planning as we transform into a different future. So I'm not sure if members of the Alliance are also plugged into that process. That's very important in, in, uh, in both planning for the future and securing the resources that are needed for that. Um, Two more things. One is uh, what we call the Nairobi Work Program, which is a stakeholder engagement um, uh, platform and a knowledge management one. Through this, we've just launched a water alliance, uh, which engages um, uh, the multilateral system in trying to transform the water context. We'd be very uh, interested in linking with uh, members of, of Guoka, Guopa as well, because that's uh, the interface with the ground level, the last mile. Um, and, and then there's sort of this whole visioning story of what the transformation mean beyond 2030 and visions of how um, legal financial uh, systems can transform to accommodate that uh, beyond incremental change that needs to happen. So there's a, 
uh, a foresight-based initiative that we have, um, the, the Resilience Frontiers Initiative, which I think um, is, is a nice way of being pulled by the future to see um, good examples that already exist now that need to be replicated. So some, some countries have given legal personality to rivers, for example, and we're investigating these, how does that help in that future that we're looking at. Moving from seeing water as a factor of production um, and towards seeing it more as, a, as, a, as an essential component of life, moving from an extractive to a regenerative world, moving from a context where you, your, your economic model is based on individualism and, uh, and competition rather than on what you see up there, on solidarity and cooperation. So operationalizing the buzzwords that we keep repeating without implementing. And so this is where I think we are heading <laughs> between today and tomorrow. And like I started, I said, answering that question from the perspective of today and seeing the gaps today and the SDGs is a different story from seeing uh, from looking at the answer in the future in a climate transformed world where a paradigmatic shift is, is necessary. It's not just incremental, not just systemic, uh, not even just out of the box, but say it's a no box thinking. So let me stop here and, and, and leave the floor to others. Yeah, thank you. Maybe a, lot, uh, maybe, yeah, maybe a question to you because you mentioned, um, say, collaboration and, and funding, and we know that utilities are looking for funds to adapt, uh, how should they engage with, with funds like that? Because I think that is one of the big gaps that we see. Yeah, I mean, for each of the funds, there's always um, a focal point or a designated entity in the country, in, uh, in the government, which has to be approached uh, in order to prepare a project proposal. Once, once it's, uh, it's cleared at the government level, then it goes to the board of uh, the financial mechanism entity that's responsible for that funding. And, um, and uh, I mean, as long as it's well justified, then it's very easy to secure um, these resources. Okay. And I mean, it ranges, so there's, there's small, small grants uh, options all the way to large size projects. Of course, the, the higher the level that's required, the more difficult or the more steps that are needed to, to access it and the more co-financing that might be needed. Clear. Thank you very much. Yes. Let me now move to uh, engineer Tan Yaratswa Joy or TJ Niamayaro from Harara Water. Okay, ah, thank you. Um, you can just call me TJ because you. I will call, <laughs> <you laughs> call you TJ. <laughs> you will twist your, uh, your tongue saying my name. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, it's okay. yeah I'm, um, I'm, I'm curious about what kind of challenges you are facing or your, your, the city of Arara and the Water Services Department is facing when it comes to uh, resilience and also to maybe resilience in the climate change context. And also what, yeah, about the work you are doing uh, to build resilience. Okay, uh, thank you for the question. So in terms of the definition, I subscribe to what all the other colleagues have said uh, in terms of uh, our capacity to adapt to stress and changes. But where I come from, we actually go a step further where we actually want to catch up to the service level uh, of this side of the world. So to us, resilience actually entails actually catching up to your service levels, then go a step further. Then uh, in terms of uh, climate change, we've actually noticed that it has been exacerbating all the problems that we have. We have a, a lot of challenges. Uh, rapid population growth, outdated uh, town planning models, dilapidated infrastructure, and all of that. And it has been uh, affecting um, our ability to provide uh, uh, services to our, uh, uh, our citizens. Then in terms of the water, uh, or rather the work that I'm doing, uh, and to, to actually help my city become more resilient. I'm actually involved in uh, developing the climate resilience water supply plan. So basically, we are looking at our ability to provide uh, safe and reliable water services to our customers. And uh, we are trying to do this at the best overall value, right? Um, however, uh, with regards uh, to our system's uh, resilience, we actually notice that we don't have plans uh, in terms of our, our resilience. So we've been developing uh, the, the climate resilience water supply plan uh, for the city. Then um, in terms of how we've been developing uh, the plan, we're actually looking at actually gathering data 
because as uh, other co uh, colleagues have alluded to, to most of us, uh, climate change is a pseudoscience to most uh, in, the, in the part of the world where I come from. So we're actually looking at uh, gathering data, then analyzing that data and building models uh, around that data. So we actually made assumptions uh, to actually come up with models that predict what will actually uh, happen in the future in terms of uh, climate change and how all of that will affect our water supply uh, in the future. Then um, after doing that, we then come up uh, with our strategic direction of um, what we were actually going to do uh, in, the, in those plans. Then finally, we're actually seeking for commitment uh, from our policy makers. Because what, what happens uh, from where I come from, we are very good at drafting these documents, but the commitment to actually follow through and implement uh, those uh, uh, plans, it actually lacks. So we're actually looking at a situation whereby our policy makers can actually adopt it and actually follow through with the plans. Then in terms of us as the operators in actually implementing these plans, we are actually looking at uh, coming up with robust uh, monitoring and evaluation uh, programs so that we can actually see through all what we are planning. Thank you. Thank you. I have a second question to you because this um, conference is all about water operator partnerships and, and uh, yeah, knowledge or, or ch uh, exchange. Uh, what do you see as the role of uh, capacity development and peer support and WOPS uh, in building resilience? Okay, uh, thank you for the question. So I, best, I guess the best way I can explain uh, the importance of uh, water operator partnerships is to give you and uh, actually in capacity development is to give you a testimony of my own journey uh, within my water operator, within uh, my, 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 the utility where I come from and the water operator partnership we have with VAI. So I joined my, uh, my organization as a graduate trainee, uh, fresh out of college with my bachelor's in science and civil engineering. Then when I got there, uh, VAI had um, a, a water operator partnership with the city of Ferrari, the water department in particular, where I work, uh, where I work from. Um, so when I got there, uh, they were long-term experts. So basically what they do is that they bring through expertise to actually mentor uh, people within the organization so that we can be able to actually do the work ourselves. So uh, we've got uh, people who do hydraulic modeling, We've got people who help us manage non-revenue water and all of that. So I became part of the team, particularly working on the waterworks project. Then while we were doing that, they didn't identify any sort of gaps that were in the organization. So in my organization in particular, there is no water resources management component because we have a classical uh, way of handling water where you just focus on distributing the water, but we don't look further upstream to see what's happening. So. Um, uh, through the partnership with VEI, I actually went further and did my master's in water resources engineering and management, in particular IWIM. So because of that, I was then uh, nominated to do the climate resilience water supply plan. So um, I don't think all of that would have been possible if we didn't have the partnership uh, with VEI because most of those, those programs were actually funded by VEI, even the expertise we actually did, for the first time, bathymetric studies uh, with ultrasonic equipment, and all, all of those trainings were from experts that came from this side, and actually imparting their knowledge to us so that we can be better equipped to actually uh, answer our own questions, especially in terms of the climate crisis. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'd like to... Um Come to you, uh, Mrs. Uh, Ursugan Schenner. I'm, I'm hope, I hope my pronunciation is right. Perfect. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> You're the Director of International Affairs of the Marmaray Municipalities Union in, uh, in Turkey. And uh, you direct the Migration Policy Center, uh, but also work in the fields of international relations, local diplomacy, migration, asylum, social cohesion, and local government. And I was wondering could, whether you could tell something about the work that the association is doing um, in coordinating and in building resilience of the various members of the organization. 
Thank you very much. Um, firstly, I would say that it's a regional local government association in Turkey with more than 180 member municipalities. But if I may uh, explain the region a bit, uh, Marmara region is kind of the center of you know, finance, commerce, industry, education in Turkey. Uh, it accommodates almost one third of the whole population of the country, which is like 26 million residents. Um, uh, and it, it's, uh, it covers the area of 11 cities and six of them are metropolises, including the mega city of Istanbul. So it's kind of the engine of the whole country, but it also has uh, major risks in terms of resilience. Uh, I mean, firstly, it's an earthquake area. We know that Istanbul has already um, had a history with earthquake. It's also subject to many climate change related disasters like floods, like droughts. Um, large uh, forest fires, etc. So on the on one hand, it has the opportunities and potentials, but on the other hand, it has major risks in terms of resilience. Uh, so what what we when we think about the, the the problems and the challenges of the cities, we cannot think about the uh, cities on the, their uh, themselves. For instance, we cannot think about the challenges of Istanbul without thinking about the the neighboring cities. Uh, why? Because Istanbul is, for instance, using the water from Sakarya, another metropolitan city in the region. And uh, you cannot ignore this fact when you're making the territorial plans, the master plans, the resilience or adaptation plans. Um, so what we see is that as a regional association, we need to think about the problems of these cities all together. Uh, and uh, it, uh, to sit in the table with all the relevant stakeholders in the region. Uh, for that reason, uh, we actually prepared the first subnational urban policy in, in, in the country. Uh, we prepared this spatial development uh, strategic framework for the Marmara region, and it actually uh, looks into the interrelation of these cities uh, in terms of all these areas, including, of course, water and sanitation sector as well. Um, but it also it's also looking to urban rural linkages. Uh, it's also looking for nature-based solutions, as you said, for instance, uh, to you know, combat all these climate change-induced uh, um, uh, disasters. But we are also supporting these kind of um, spatial development plans and everything with regional, uh, other regional field studies, such as uh, migration, such as localization of SDGs, because we think that resilience is not, does not have only a physical impact. And, and, and you know, perspective. It also has a social pillar. We, we need to th think about the migration phenomena. We need to think about social inequalities that all these disasters are are causing. So uh, we are trying to be a regional organization, but also you know, holding some roles in national and international levels. For instance, the region's name is coming from the sea, the inland sea of Marmara, and this sea has a seasonal problem recently. Uh, and the protection of the sea and, and you know, uh, avoiding the pollution in the sea is uh, really important for us as an association. And it's not the problem of only one city. It's not a problem of only Istanbul, for instance. It's a problem of all coastal cities. So uh, we are the national coordinator for the protection of the Marmara Sea together with the Minister of Environment. We are the only structure, uh, supporting stru structure of covenant of mayors in Turkey, etc. So we are trying to merge all these regional, national, and international roles in terms of uh, ensuring resilience. Thank you. And you already mentioned a bit, but, but if you look at um, water resources, this, this you mentioned that this is a uh, is a, at least a division challenge. But w what is the immediate? issues that these uh, municipalities are facing? Yeah, it is a challenge, but what we are trying to do as an association is trying to increase the capacities of our local governments and their you know, public utility companies and affiliates, but also you know, um, trying to foster the peer support programs. Um, uh, so uh, we have a local government academy and we are training over 16,000 municipal officers each year. And these programs cover, you know, in general, sustainability issues, uh, water and sanitation programs, resilience, etc. Um, but we, what we believe is that it's also important to save uh, the resources of the municipalities. So with this um, uh, mentor program that we are, we are applying, we are trying to match the municipalities who are in need of a spe specific expertise in a field, say a water issue, 
uh, with, a, with a municipality who is already experienced in that field. So we are trying to save human resources, you know, financial resources of the municipalities, and we are trying to facilitate this uh, knowledge of uh, the exchange of knowledge and information and experience between local governments. Uh, what I can say is that I heard in the morning that um, there is a new target of 100 WOPs, new WOPs uh, for the near future, and we, we have just become a group, a member as Marmara Municipalities Union, so that would be our commitment that we would be really enthusiastic and we would be really glad to, you know, support GROPA for establishing these new WOPs. Uh, and we can uh, always, uh, you know, uh, mobilize our mentor program for such kind of matches, uh, you know, and uh, building new partnerships. So you mean that you would also be make resources available for other utilities outside the uh, yeah. network, your own association available? Uh, yeah. yeah, because water and sanitation administrations are really, really important for us and we are working with them uh, together with our local governments. So. Um, that will be really meaningful to, you know, match them with other counterparts in other parts of the world. Ah, that's fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> I'm looking a little bit at the time because we also need to go for lunch, but I have one question which I didn't fully ask to you, um, Dr. Meinziger, but um, you mentioned, you talked about the resilience strategies of um, Hamburg Wasser. But I was also wondering, I know that Hamburg Wasser is also active in, in WOPs and Water Operator Partnerships. Could you elaborate a little bit on what, what you're doing and how that also links to this theme of this conference? Yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, Hamburg Wasser, we, we are one of the first German utilities really um, acting for um, Water Operators Partnerships. And um, we are very happy that um, we are having great partners internationally. We are active in five um, WAPs, and um, there are, there's a lot of um, knowledge exchange. Um, capacity building is an important issue, enhancing technical skills, um, and also having the ability to adapt, to change, and to, to increase um, the, the um, capacities and of, of the staff. And for us, for, for Hamburg Wasser, I think it is very important also to engage in such a peer-to-peer -peer support, also to create a culture of innovation in our own utility, because I think that is so important when it comes to resilience. You need to be able to, to see the change or the threats or risks that are there, and you need to be able to adapt, and therefore this spirit of innovation is crucial, and I think the exchange with, with other utilities is not only about the technical issues, but it's about how this learning, the lifelong learning can, can be um, addressed and, and to increase the willingness. And, and for us, it's also about being um, an attractive um, employer so that we really um, show that how, how much value we give um, to innovation and change in capacity development. Thank you. So with this, I think we should start ending this session because of time. But it was very um, inspiring to first get facts on what is, what is ongoing in the different UN offices, but also how we can relate uh, with what you're doing. And, it, and also to hear from you on the different strategies with respect to resilience build, building within the, the different municipalities and operators that we work with. And also hear about the, the role, the potential role of uh, water operator partnerships and, and exchange. So this already brings indeed, like you said, um, a bit of flesh to the bones to the commitment of GWOPA when it comes to the 100 extra WOPs towards 2030. I can also say from the Dutch uh, water sector side, we're very much committed to continue our journey with the water operator partnerships. We're very much um, working on that already, but we see there is a lot of benefits in this uh, exchange between utilities and there is a lot to learn. And especially in this field of resilience building, climate, climate adaptation, addressing vulnerability, that we have a lot uh, to do both uh, in Europe, but also everywhere in the world. So I would like to end it here and give the floor to um, Julie, Julie Perkins, to give us some uh, messages, logistic messages. Sure. Sure. <laughs> Informally, thanks so much, that great panel. Um, just, uh, first of all, welcome. It's really great to see uh, you all here. Um, just a few logistics messages, then before we go for lunch. Um, first, for those of you who have not yet 
received your um, badges, please pass by the reception uh, in the course of the day to pick them up. It's important that you get them. You'll need them for tomorrow. They also contain the Wi-Fi code, which you're all very interested in. You can only get that if you get your badge. Um, and once you have your badge, you're uh, eligible to request a voucher for the reception this evening at the City Hall. It's going to be a really nice evening, so please uh, request that from Kati at the reception desk if you'd like to go. Um, the vouchers that you would receive have a QR code on them with the location of the venue, so that, that you could find that on, the, on your voucher. Um, for sponsored participants, um, you can also see Rose. Um, I think you've received already a message about that, but Rose is a person that you would look for at the reception. Um, that's either today or tomorrow, please. Um, and then I've noticed that some of you have found your way to the headsets, um, but not everyone perhaps realizes that there's interpretation in uh, Arabic, French, uh, Spanish, and of course in English as well in this plenary, but also in many of the thematic sessions. So do take advantage of that. You pick up the headsets and you can keep them the whole day. Um, you don't need to return them until the end of the day, but then at the end of the day, please do kindly return them. Um, and it's very easy to use. There's one uh, language, you just go from room to room and you'll always have your language uh, available if, if the language is, if, if it's sponsored. Uh, I mean, if it's sponsored, if it's uh, translated, interpreted, uh, if that language is available. And I think, I'm basically, the, the program, there, if there has been any um, change to room locations, you'll find the updated program on the electronic panels that are just outside the room. So that's just to make sure that you're checking with the right information. Um, and then the final information is that lunch is about to be served. Lunch is at your own expense. Um, there's a res res uh, restaurant here, though, in the, in the hall for you to get what you need, and there are also food trucks outside in case um, you would like to try something different. Um, and those are all the messages. Please enjoy your lunch and your afternoon. Thanks. Thank you. 